Mr. Jennings that even in the North, as much as it is in the South, and just looking at the patterns of how politically people um, maneuver, the, maneuver the government, maneuver businesses, maneuver people, would you say that in the South it's more overt and in, in, in the North it's just more in behind the, the scenes? Yeah, well, well it's de facto segregation in the North. White people never had a problem living with black people in the South because black people served them and, and they were always comfortable with black people around them. But in the North, it's a different story. White people had this here de facto type of segregation for a long time. They didn't want us in the same neighborhood with them. We had to constantly fight back during the 60s. The young people today, they don't remember the struggle that black people went through. They hold the sick on them, dog sick on them, you know. And, but we had a, 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 a real good Messiah or leader in, in, in Reverend King and some of the other ministers back then, and we had uh, leadership from some of the militant black people, and we had leadership from a lot of the white people that were sick of segregation. And we did prevail and won a lot of rights, and we were able to move wherever we wanted to move. But at that time, I think that did, you know, a, a, a lot of harm to a lot of the blacks because a lot of our people that could move on up, you know, they did not reach back and try to help the other blacks. If you, when I first moved here in Cleveland, there were black businesses all over Cleveland back in 61, 62. You know, right. look at 105, you go down there, there was all kinds of businesses. Right. And black people were contained mostly because it wasn't fair housing then. But after they could move to the suburbs, the neighborhood, right. that's right, the neighborhoods, uh, just degenerated completely. And uh, as I said, see the white man, not, not, see, not all white people, but when I say the white man, some of the white people, the, the, the power structure, they're behind this. And they manipulate the middle class and the poor white people as well as they manipulate the middle class and poor black people. Once they found out that we had gained these rights, they used that old method of divide. divide and conquer, divide and conquer. So they bought out our leadership. They figured it was advantageous for them to buy out our leadership, like people like George Ford, Arnold Pinckney, the ministers. Now, Carl Stokes, he was well aware of what they did, because when he left here and went to New York, to be uh, an anchor in television, he had designated Pinckney to run for mayor. He thought that they would follow his legacy for Cleveland. They were in the caucus with Reverend, I mean, with uh, Congressman Lewis Stokes, who was now running the caucus. Carl started that because he felt that the black uh, we're not getting fair treatment from the county Democratic Party. So he said, we will get a, a caucus of our own. We will designate candidates and elect candidates, black and white. We will be nonpartisan. And that's how he got Virgil Brown, a Republican, and all of them in the caucus, and they were backing Republicans as well as Democrats. And he had pulled the black constituents of voters away from the Democratic Party. So... Uh, now, this is absolutely what happened. After Carl left, the, uh, I think it was Gary Foley, who, oh, they, they were, I think he was chairman of the Democratic Party, but uh, they went and co-opted George Ford and Arnold Pinckney to vote, to leave the caucus, and gave them token co-chairmanships of the Democratic Party to bring them into their fold. And they left Lewis Stokes at that time. And they became nothing but cat's paws and tokens for the Democratic Party down through the years. Well, Carl was outraged. He told me that they sold out completely. I may help to make these guys, and I thought that they would stand up, you know, 
for the black people in the community, they have completely sold out. And as George's record, and I've often said on my program, you can come sit down with me and rebut anything I say, but bring his record, because I got his real record when he gets here. I just got all kinds of uh, fouls on these people, what they've done down through the years. But Bob Hughes, who was chairman of the Republican, uh, Republican Party here in the county, he called him Uncle Tom. Jim Barrett showed me a newspaper clipping where he called him Uncle Tom. I guess he was outraged because he was, his party was benefiting from Carl Stokes' uh, 21st Caucus and Lou Stokes' 21st Caucus because they were backing Republicans as well as Democrats. That they were nonpartisan. He called him Uncle Tom. And later, he ended up partnering up with George Ford. So George Ford became a rep dem. He was working both ends from the middle, you know, and everything come up that the establishment wanted, you would find in George Ford backing it up and, 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 and putting on the big pretense that he was so much in love with the black people and defending the rights of black people. And that hurt him more than anything else when they had a radio program calling them honkers and whiteys and denigrating the white people, which later, you know what I mean, came to uh, discredit and hurt him when he ran for mayor against Mike White. Relationship with Carl Stokes? Well, I didn't know Carl Stokes personally until uh, Carl came back here from uh, New York. When he ran for me, I stayed up all night. I wasn't in politics or involved with it or anything, but like any black person, I was just proud to see a black man running. When he lost the first one, me and my wife, we donated to the campaign. And the second time when he ran against Taft and he won, you know, we thought that was one of the greatest things that could happen here. A black man is now mayor of a major city. Did you help the campaign? Did you work uh, at campaign? that time? No, I wasn't involved in the campaign. We would just donate, you know, sign petitions to put them on the ballot and mm -hmm. things like that. But I was not involved in, in politics uh, uh, until I told you when my son was attacked by the Shaker Height police. Really? And I got in the Pua. Uh, now, that's when I became a member of the 21st Caucus. And then uh, later I was bringing so much publicity in the, to the caucus because I was promoting this here review board for an elected review board that I spoke about on the first segment. Right. And Carl came back here to run for judge, and that's when I met him. And I got in his campaign at that time, and he got to be elected judge. And he saw what, I guess, what type of person I was, you know, uh, in fighting for the review board, I went against Lou Stokes, who was trying to tell me that George Ford would have uh, thought that a, a appointed review board would be good. And I said, no, that ain't not Lou. You know, a uh, appointed review board was just controlled by the people that appointed. We need an independent elected review board, somebody that the government had nothing to do with. But as I said, we got the petitions so out. This is the review board for? Uh, to rule against police brutality and stuff, to review the police whenever they use uh, wrongdoing or excessive force and things like that, or shootings and killings, to review whether or not it was justified or not, because they were whitewashing all of this stuff. As I pointed out before in the Plain Deal, it just came out this year, uh, several weeks ago, with an article that the review board they got in there. And, they they are, they have approved almost every complaint that's ever been up there. I mean, they ruled against every complaint that's ever been up there and ruled in favor of the police. How does the Collin Post report on these issues? Well, at that time, they reported real militant because the Collin Post had Harry Alexander back then that was editor of it and John Lanier, mm -hmm. and uh, they they gave us a lot of publicity I, I, uh, about our protests and what we were fighting for at, at the time. Uh, but Carl and I, he, he's the one, as I spoke before, that talked me into, and, and Dorothy Miller, who was another activist in the community, and she was a very close friend of Carl, even when he was, before he was even elected to office. He used to shoot pool up there on Kinsman and, and things like that. She worked as, uh, at the county building. I would drive her to work, and I, I worked for Benny Bonanno across the street in the Justice Center. And a lot of times that I said, I'd go up and talk to Carl in his chamber at lunchtime. And he had said, Bert, somebody got to go out in the street because these people have sold out. I mean, the police are killing people out here. Nobody's saying anything. The ministers, the, the black politicians, nobody. 
He said, but it's got to be, like in the 60s, it's got to be some protest. Somebody's got to make some noise. So I said, well, maybe I can get the caucus to do that. And he said, forget that. That's Lou's thing. Lou was running the caucus, and he said, they're not going to do anything. They're too political. So I said, maybe we need a, a, another organization, a protest organization. So they said, well, if that's what you think, you can do it, whatever you want. So I, I, I went and told Dorothy, and then that's how we organized the GPAC, the grassroots uh, committee, you know political action committee, and then we uh, joined up with Ali Bay. You remember Ali Bay? Of course you do. Uh, coalition for a Better Life. We formed a coalition with other people, and we were able to have large protests downtown about, you know, the fact the case, selling dope in the uh, police, letting them sell dope in the community, police brutality, you know, t taking tax abatement from the school, all of that stuff. This was about what year? This was in the 80s? Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that, that got started about 1988 or, or 87. So Carl and I became great friends after we got this started because he was gay. See, he couldn't speak out as a judge. But uh, we would, I would confer with him and Jim Barrett whatever we would do. When we started that about uh, the Sea Force to change the uh, council president's term. Carl told us, said, you know, uh, that if we were scared the hell out of them, but it probably we wouldn't get it. He said, because they're going to bring all the blacks out and say and they discriminate. He had just the vision to know exactly what would happen. Most of the white people voted to throw, to change the term, but the black people voted overwhelming. I think that was the first time black people outvoted white people because they changed it into the white people wanted to get rid of George. You see, that's how they put that kind of spin on things. They got a lot of money. They spent over hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, we just have that much money, but we had the issue and truth on our side. But then I said uh, our committee made the mistake of uh, not going through letting it go to the ballot and trusted George, as I said, to put an appointed school board, which I objected to and never even uh, went over to even talk to George with him. I told him, don't do it because you can't make a leopard change his spot. And consequently, they started this here uh, point of view review board, which is just a bunch of eunuchs. I mean, you know, they're as useless as uh, what you might say, others on a bull, as, as, as doing anything right. And uh, we, we, we gave it our best shot. We tried everything, but we had everything against us. The black ministers weren't doing anything because we, we criticized them. Moss, Mac Mickle, you know, I've had base discrimination. That Reverend Mac Mickle told me it was discrimination, as I said before, when he was head of the NAACP. And uh, that's when they were building that shopping center in Shaker Heights out there, going to build it. And they said they had to be race conscious. I even got the, the secret uh, documents, uh, recommendation, you know. But, and I showed that to Reverend Mac Mickle. But these people have been so completely bought out that they don't serve the interests. As you saw the hospital closing, you didn't hear Lou Stokes. You didn't hear Reverend Mac Mickle. You didn't hear... Uh, uh, Reverend Malls, Matthews, and all of them out there protesting. You heard little Jennings Crusaders running around to keep St. Michael's open. What, what hospital was this that closed? Mount Sinai and St. Luke, mm -hmm. because Sam Miller, and, who was on the board of directors at Cleveland Clinic, and Al Lerner mm -hmm. was on that board, they wanted these hospitals closed down, you know, and, and, and so Cleveland Clinic and, and University Hospital control the whole medical hospital system in, in here. And it was all manipulated by the establishment. You would say this happened in a short period of time. We're in 2007 now, so a lot of this began, a lot of this big change began in the 80s. Yeah. And it, it, and it is complete now with... Cleveland Clinic and University Hospital. Yeah, they just control just about everything, and uh, Stephanie Tubb Jones didn't step up to the plate either, and she was highly criticized because we were out there marching and protesting that, and uh, Ms. Henley criticized her uh, on television. Now, later, several years ago, Cleveland Clinic wanted to close down the trauma center at Huron Road. Now, that's in East Cleveland where we got all kinds of uh, violence and killings and different things going on, not to mention 
uh, adjacent to it is the Cleveland area, Mount Pleasant, you know, so with a high crime area. And Stephanie knew that that time that if she didn't step up to the plate, you know, what to expect. It's not she flexed her muscle to show you what a politician can do if they really want to do something, because she's a powerful woman. Mm -hmm. She told Cleveland Clinic, you know, if you do that, I can't bring no more money in here for you as well. Yeah. They left the trauma center there. See what I'm saying? It reminds me of when now, you were talking about when you were a child in, in the South and you couldn't get into a hospital. So the same thing would have occurred here in Cleveland. Well, they would have had hospitals, but, but you, have to go so far. you have to go so far. By the time they take you to uh, from yeah. the east side over to Metro, right. where they got good trauma centers, right. and Cleveland Clinic, you know, they don't do too much to help. Uh, the poor people, I mean, their emergency situation over there is not geared. They'll give you Band-Aid treatment because I've taken people over there and kick them right out in the street if they don't have any money or no medical, you know, support. So that was it. That is a good hospital in Huron Road. At least it's right in the heart of the black community where there's a lot of violence going on, and you can at least get somebody there right away. Even that policeman was taken there that was shot by this uh a uh, mentally ill guy or whatever, you know, but th th this is what happens. We have, and, and it's just not me saying that or, or our group, people are saying that all over. I mean, uh, leaders that we are going backwards, that we do not have the support of black leadership. And as I said, Mike White, who always said that Carl was his mentor and yet didn't invite him to the Black Mayor's Conference that we had to pick him. He <laughs> uh, was the type of mayor that sold out to the establishment. See, every, he, he ran himself wild to get that stadium down there built while the schools were falling apart. Mike White did, you know. He saw him racing all over to get the Brown Stadium done. And Sam Miller was his surrogate daddy or something. Mm -hmm. See how he aligned himself. But our people have no unity and no leadership. Until we solve that problem, we're going to be out in left field. You have a letter there that you wanted to share with us from Carl because you became very close to him. Yeah, well, when he became ambassador, this was written January the 17th, 1995. And uh, you had that. He said, Dear Bert, it was good to hear from you and Juanita, my wife. Happy New Year to both of you. I've enclosed a pen that I would ordered for Christmas gift, but it didn't arrive until January. But I wanted you to have one, Bert, because you'll always remain one of my favorite friends. Your bright mind, your resolutions on issues, and your gifted writing ability has created its own history and its own fan club, of which I am one. Warm regards, Carl. And he sent me that Parker pen set, which, of course, I would never use. I keep it as a memento. And when Carl passed away, and he had a big funeral downtown, they had him in the rotunda there at City Hall. Most of the people up there, not, a lot of them up there were Carl's enemies at the time. Jim Barrett and I were at the funeral. We knew that. You know, some of them was his close friends. Uh, J James, that was his uh, law director, but there was George Forbes up there and Arnold Pinckney sitting up there and uh, Mike White, and Mike White lied over his deceased body when he said that he went up to visit Carl, and there was a black nurse in the room, and Carl asked her, do you know who this is, do you know who this is, and this is Mike White, and he's been a good mayor. Well, we knew that was a lie, because Carl... He he had detested him, and Carl could carry a grudge to the grave with him. He because he had told us Mike had never invited him over to City Hall for coffee to ask him any advice or anything. But now here he was trying to, you know, to enhance his prestige and everything over Carl's deceased body. Miss Chapman, who had ran that caucus as director for years, loyal people like that, were sitting down in the audience. So we decided after that that we would do a motorcade to his gravesite. A few days after he was buried, 
the common people and pay our respects. And so we started that. And no media was out there other than the call and post. All the media that had covered him, we had sent out news releases that the little people were going out to have a gravesite ceremony. They didn't show up. The plane deal and none of the TV stations. And when I spoke, I complained. I was telling them, you know, that these people didn't care about what the little people thought about Carl. And at that time, McKellar Judkins was out there and Raul was video, uh, videoing it. And Raul told me, he said, Bert, why don't you start your own media? You can take this tape and go down and get you a public access television program. And McKellar, she's already got one. She, she, she can show you how to do that. And that's when I got involved with the Carl Stoke Four during my time. I also urged a lot of prisoners that were convicted to ask the trial court for their records, which of course it would be denied, but it would be preserved in the record that they had made that motion. Well, in the Crenshaw and Griffin case that were convicted, they later came down to Statesville, and I was able to appeal their case on that particular issue, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. My petition for certiorari that I had written for them was granted. They were appointed a lawyer, it was heard by the Supreme Court, and a landmark decision was made that the states had to provide a free transcript and an attorney to appeal any prisoner's case that requested that. So that no longer made the trial court the court of last resort for poor or indigent defendants. That was my second victory before the United States Supreme Court. And the other one was my case, which the whole court handed down a procurium opinion. And you know, they don't often agree on everything, but a procurium opinion in which they did not even have a hearing in Washington, just based on my petition for certiorari that a federal judge, Judge Camel, in the Northern District of Illinois, had denied my petition for rid of habeas corpus without making findings of facts or conclusions of law. And they, the Court of Appeals, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in uh, Illinois upheld Judge Camel. They overruled that. So two f federal courts was overruled based on the law that I had case law I have presented to the United States Supreme Court, their own law that said I was entitled to that. So I guess uh, they were at the point of saying, well, if they just won't listen to our law, you know, why should we worry, worry about calling lawyers up here to argue this and filing brief? It's clear Mr. Jennings or this defendant or petitioner has presented the correct law to these judges. Now, it wasn't because I'm smarter than these judges. No, I've never felt that because they're, they're trained legal people. It's that they did not want to follow the law. They, they always was talking about opening a floodgate. Well, they fooled around and it opened a floodgate, not only in Illinois, but all over the country. When they ruled in Griffin versus Illinois, you got to give a free appeal to prisoners. That was outstanding. Well, I, I, that was my 15 minutes of fame, and I look back on that, and I figure, you know, I, I, that changed my whole life was by study of law while I was incarcerated and the things that I had to go through as a fighter. And that's what Carl said, you know, same thing. There's lawyers, thousands of them, never will win a case, never have won a case before the highest court. And here you are, an untrained lawyer, and you were able to, and not only that, uh, the help free, you know, uh, uh, quite a few men, 20 people under the Post-Conviction Act. And, and some of them were absolutely innocent. And so that's why we don't have one law to try the innocent and the guilty. It's one law to try everybody. You're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and you get in a fair trial, a fair trial. And there's so many people that do not get fair trials, and there's a lot of judges that shouldn't even be on the bench. If you remember this, Judge Gallagher. Now here the judge was sitting in the common plea court downtown. Yeah. The, the, a young guy. Now he got elected to the bench, and while he's on the bench, Michael Gallinger made history last month when he became the first Cuyahoga County Common Pleas judge ever sentenced to federal prison for dealing cocaine. What year was that? Huh? Oh, oh this was in uh, April 1996. So, so well, this was uh, when the Sunday came out, the paper was 1996, he was 39 years old. 
And so that was uh, last month. So if this was April, that was in March of 1996. That he he's on the bench and selling drugs and using drugs. Gallagher investigation began last June when Secret Service agents broke up a Palmer Heights counterfeiting ring that printed bogus currency to buy powder, cocaine, and crack. As arrests were made, deals were cut with informants. One of them started talking about a man everybody called the judge. And as I told you, over here we had uh, Jim Colombo the one that was trying my case and was so busy trying to tell Judge Jaffe to let him bring my criminal record up. At the same time, he probably was using crack cocaine because it wasn't long after that that he got busted for stealing drugs out of the evidence room there and, and, and using them for his personal consumption. So, so now you got to think that this is the tip of the iceberg. It's a lot of people down there, they're alcoholics on the bench, they got problems, but it's, it's difficult to, to catch these people in high office, police officers that are doing wrong. You see what I'm saying? It's just like criminals. They only catch a fraction of, of, of the people committing crimes. I mean, you know, a one, uh, they may catch one criminal for a, a crime that he's committed, but he's committed maybe several, 50, maybe 100 crimes and got away with them. You see what I'm saying? So it's just like this. They catch a few that slip through the cracks or they a, a, a slip up and they're able to catch them, but it's not that a lot of prosecutors. Now, this was another case of this black prosecutor not too long ago. Same thing. He was using drugs and taking bribes. Uh, they sent him to the penitentiary. So a lot of people in high places, and of course we're reading every day in the newspaper about all of these here CEOs of these big companies and even up in the administration of government, uh, how they are ripping off and stealing, committing fraud, and all these other different things. So I think I, think I heard you say that your advice to the young people today is to try to stay away, oh, not try, but do stay away. Avoid getting that record because once you get that record, it affects your life tremendously. Now, a lot of p people, they may not have th the knowledge of, of how to circumvent, you know, uh, the system to get ahead because sooner or later, maybe somebody will come along and expose you. It never happened while I was working out there in the community. Uh, because I wasn't known that well here, although I met people I served time with here that was living here. And, uh, of course, they didn't know where I was working or, or, or under what conditions I was working or anything like that. It didn't matter because years had passed. But it wasn't at the time that I felt that I could go to anybody and tell them, well, you, you know, I'm qualified, you know, I've got these certificates for uh, business administration, I can type, I know this is, you know, I could be, do this job, and they would give me a job, but I've been convicted of a felon. So I never, at that time, even thought about, you know, going uh, up and revealing that to any employee, and uh, I wanted to work, and I did work, and, uh, and although I had to use subterfuge, you know what I mean, to cover my past, uh, and then I did work, and, and, and it was all right because... Because you turned your life around. Absolutely. You used that bad experience to learn from, to, and then that knowledge that you gained from that bad experience, you spent the rest of your life using that knowledge for good. Uh, absolutely. Well, the thing is, I've been here since 1962. All right, what is that, 46 years? Mm -hmm. I have never slept a night in jail in this town even about the uh, arson case there. All they did was send me an indictment, and I had Attorney Tolliver, and we went down to arraignment, and I put up a bond, and sat down there for a couple of hours, you know what I mean, and, and, and walked right out. So I never have slept a night in jail or been arrested for any felonies or anything other than a couple of little bonus, or little traffic tickets. I mean... <laughs> All of these years now, but yet, if I've come up to oppose these people in any way or some kind of way, just like I pointed out here, they would try to bring up something that happened 
40 years or over 50 years ago, let's if you go back to 48 when the, uh, the felony occurred. Let's pause <laughs> here and take a look at some of the good things that you've done because you've got quite a few certificates over here that I would like to get on camera. So if we could stop here and... Uh, uh, you going to introduce it? Okay. Mr. Jennings, we'd just like to ask you about some of the awards that you've won over the years. We know that you've talked about how they will not let you live down your record, but this is the good record that people forget to talk about. So we wanted you to talk a little bit about that, and then as we get to the end, I see we're going to get into a little bit of uh, poetry, which is something that you enjoy. So if you would mind going through some of those and pointing out for the camera some of these awards so we can see the good record that, that you have uh, established over the years. Well, uh, they honored me in Cleveland Heights at the Civic Center down there, Mayfield and Superior, and some of these awards were the result of that. Uh, I received awards from quite a few people. Uh, Frank Russo, he's a county auditor, and uh, I received an award from uh, Jane Campbell, uh, proclamation, Cleveland Municipal Court, Judge Larry Jones sent this award commending me, and then uh, I had this uh, award here from the city of Cleveland that uh, was signed by uh, Frank Jackson. I think he was president of council then. And then uh, Tim McCormick and Peter Lawson Jones, Jimmy DeMore from the county commissioner. And this is one I received from the House of Representatives, and this one when I retired from the Cleveland Municipal Clerk of Court. Uh, Jane Campbell was a legislature, and she had the Ohio House present me with that one. And these are some over here uh, for leadership and uh, some more commending me for uh, my activities in the community, and some for my volunteer work. This is one I like very much was given by the Media Associates of Cleveland and Friends. Congratulates Talbert Jennings. And they said, for his outstanding performance as the watchdog for the underdog, and because uh, we always try to look out for the little people and the disenfranchised people in the community and be a spokesperson for them. And these are some for volunteering and speaking at the schools to the young people. So, uh, and of course, I, I do poetry as a hobby, and... I belong to the International Society of Poets, and I did submit a poet that they liked, and they gave me that award for that at the recent convention down in Las Vegas. So, Mr. Jennings, as we can see that you have, uh, you may have a past record that some wish to bring out, but certainly over the last 50 years, you can point to many things that Positive, some, you know, to of your course. Good yeah, because uh, as I said, we are the results of what we have thought, and what we will be in the future is determined by what we think today. So if we thought negative, maybe in our youth, and then later on we learned the lessons of our past, and then we became positive in our later adulthood and senior years, uh, you know, to make some kind of contribution. And there's a lot of people out there that have done the same thing. Harley L. Jones in the community, you know, I can name a lot of them. Boxer and, and uh, Khalil Samad and, of course, Ali Bay. You know, he was a, a great leader in the community. He had a past record. And these men tried to do something constructive later on. Harley L. Jones and Ali Bay, you know, they worked down there at the... Uh, uh, center on 55th Street, and uh, th they were helping the uh, people. They were t trying to advise the young men coming out of prison and, and, and uh, the young people down there against uh, life of crime and things like that. So it's a lot of 
people that do come out of prison rehabilitated that try to use their experience to guide the young people in the community. And I always uh, very proud of Khalid Samad. In fact, I had a, a right there, here's a task force for community mobilization. This was given to me by Khalid Samad. For, yeah, for over 40 years he was talking about, and you know, he has this here gang task force to try to discourage these children and young people from engaging in that criminal activity. Sister Jennings, we, we are coming to the end of our interview, and I wanted to just hear your thoughts on how the, the United States, Cleveland, and the United, in the United States, where we're going from a global perspective, where, where do you see all of this going um, for your grandchildren? What, what, what well, advice see, I'm, do you want to uh, give them? Well, I'm greatly disturbed because, see, uh, my life is put, pretty much over. And as I tell my grandchildren, you young people today, you know, you're engaged in things like uh, uh, hip-hop and, and this gangster rap and all these negative television games that promote violence and degradation of black women who you should be giving your total respect to. I'm saying a, a lot of them are doing this, and a lot of you are engaged in criminal activity and drugs, which is, you know, destroying your reputation early on, and you're not getting an education. A lot of young men, they say they have eight black women in the college for every one black man. So if something isn't done to correct that, then these young black people today are going to fail miserably because they won't be able to get decent jobs in, in, in the workforce. And the prison complex is just a disaster. When I was in prison, as Ebony Magazine pointed out back in the 40s, they only had 37 black people, 1,000, 37 black people, I believe it was, in penitentiary all across the country. Today, they have like almost a million. So, and it's a revolving door. Most are nonviolent drug people. Mm -hmm. And they have deliberately set this kind of situation up. It's nothing but a form of slavery. Yes. And it was done by design to open privatized prisons. And what better uh, product could they have than uh, drug users? That's like a revolving door, you know, they're in and out. And uh, instead of treating these people as sick people and not uh, putting them in a felony conviction, you know, which would be much cheaper. But they open these penitentiaries and turn them over to a lot of privatization and it's destroying them. So I tell my grandkids, if you young people don't come to grips with this problem yourself and maybe take the advice of us elders, you know, you're going to suffer tremendously, but I won't be here to see you suffer because at almost 85 years old, you know, I can only expect so many more years. Yeah. My Social Security is good. They're talking Republican about privatizing it, you know. It's going to destroy whatever you work for. Yeah. I'll be getting mine until I die in my pension. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, you'll only decrease yourself into further poverty, further degradation, if you don't read the handwriting on the wall and change your lifestyle. So, as I said, I always learn to respect women. I don't care whatever. When we was back there doing our little bad things, we used to always walked in, took our hats off in the house, because Mama would always say the roof don't leak, say yes, ma'am, to, to people and respect the old people and help them. Yeah. We weren't out robbing elderly people and hurting them, yes. you know? Things have changed, but you know, we're going to uh, use this interview to deliver your message to young people. When people hear and see this interview, they will hear from an elder that is advising them to stay in school. That's right. Well, good education is priceless. Watch the music. Right. Watch the music and and 
focus on a career that is going to be helpful to you, your family, and the community in which you live. Uh, well, that's what, that's what I would love to see for my grandkids and every other kid to coming up out there, you know. But something has to be done because the murder in Baltimore, I was just looking at it, it's almost a murder day. In Cleveland here, we have too many killings. And, 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 and this is all brought about by poor governing, governance. Our governments are not stepping up doing the job that they should do. They're too concerned with greed, corporate greed, taking the money away from the schools, you know, not putting money into the community to try to turn these young children and young people around. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna continue to count ask for your counsel in that regard. Um, we're going to end the interview here with this these last few words from you, if you'd like to give them. But I'd like to say thank you very much. Well I want to say thank you for taking your time to share your story so it can be an inspiration to someone else. Well, I want to thank you and Fred for coming out and uh, doing this. Uh, I really appreciate it and I hope it might be helpful. You know, I've always had the highest regard and respect for you as director of the Black Afro-American Museum. I know you are a committed person in the community, so it's always a great pleasure to be associated with you. I know some of our organizations, we've held our affairs down there at the African American uh, Museum. Yes. And you've always been, uh, and I truly miss your associate and colleague, Jojo. <laughs> and he, he was a wonderful person. He was a wonderful yes, person. Yes, right. And well, so, thank you. Uh, so anytime I can be of help, you know what I mean? We're going to use I, this. I, I wouldn't hesitate. We're going to use this as an inspiration to others. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you.